Father, we love you. Thank you for getting us to this point in the week. Thank you for the joy and refreshment that we can get from gathering, uh, fellowshipping with one another, learning more about you and learning more about some of these great men in our history. Father, I pray that you would guide this teaching time. I pray that you would help us to learn and long to be more like you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so George Whitfield. Talked to Miss Julie Henry back there. She told me she watched two movies about his life in preparation for tonight. So she's going to critique me after this is over. But George Whitfield is a name that, that many of you may not be familiar with. He's not quite maybe the name that like a Martin Luther might be. We talked about him a few weeks ago. So I guess maybe we should start by saying, why George Whitfield? Why are we devoting a night of this study to talk about this man? Pastor mentioned the first Great Awakening, and George Whitfield was one of the primary catalysts in that, along with Jonathan Edwards. It's estimated, now this is amazing, listen to this, it's estimated that he spoke about 1,000 times every year for 30 years. It's incredible. This is a man who would spend 40 to 60 hours every week speaking. So not like preparing to speak and speaking, but he'd spend about 40 to 60 hours a week speaking. Uh, one biographer wrote about him and said, his whole life may be said to have been consumed in the delivery of one continuous or scarcely uninterrupted sermon. His sermons were frequently interrupted by, by people just being overcome with emotion as they were listening to him, loud weeping and, and shrieking from the audience. Crowds, now, now listen, we're, we're talking about the 18th century. Crowds would gather to hear him between 10 and 20,000 people regularly. It's amazing. This is a man who was born in England, we'll talk more about that in a minute, but who traveled extensively. He traveled throughout England, obviously, Ireland, Scotland. He made seven trips over here to the colonies. He preached in just about every city along the eastern seaboard from Maine down to Georgia. It's estimated that about 80% of the population of the American colonies at that time heard him speak at least once. Isn't that incredible? At one point, it's not an exaggeration to say that he was the most popular figure in America. He's definitely the most influential figure in the first generation of evangelicalism in America. And if you think about him being internationally known, he's really the first internationally known famous itinerant preacher. So let's talk a little bit about his life. You see a timeline there. In front of you, he was born 1714 in England. He grew up in an inn. His dad was an innkeeper, and he grew up there in that inn. And sadly, at the age of two, his father died. He left behind uh, a widow and seven children. His mother, Elizabeth, remarried uh, when, when he was about eight years old. But that wasn't ever a good marriage. George Whitfield would look back and call it, it was an unhappy match, is what he said. Uh, the guy was no good. He tried to take over the inn. He kind of ran it into the ground. After six years of a really troubled, rocky marriage, she left him. And so once again, he was without a father figure in the home. When he was 18, he enrolled uh, in Oxford University. And it was there that he met... John and Charles Wesley, probably names that you are familiar with. John, of course, the famous preacher, and Charles, the great hymn writer. You know, Charles Wesley wrote about 6,000 hymns, many of which we still sing today. But Charles Wesley, there at Oxford, had started a few years prior to this a club, a club devoted to people who wanted serious um, to take their spirituality seriously, to discipline themselves. It was a club uh, that the students there at Oxford sort of mockingly called the Holy Club. Well, that's the Holy Club 
meeting. And because of their methodical way of life and the way that they disciplined themselves so strictly and rigidly, they also began to be called the Methodists. Some of the things they did, they would fast twice a week. They would visit the prisons regularly. They'd spend hours every day meeting and in Bible studies and to talk uh, about other devotional studies. They took their spirituality seriously, but as you can see from the next thing on your timeline there, during this time, George Whitfield was not a believer. He was, he was doing all of these things, he was doing all of these outward signs, he just wasn't actually a believer. Uh, Charles Wesley encouraged him to read the book, The Life of God and the Soul of Man, and that book challenged him. It challenged his faith. It, it showed him that, that his good works that he was doing was never going to earn salvation. And so he would look back and, and he would write about that, and he said, though I had fasted and watched and prayed and received the sacrament so long, yet I never knew what true religion was. So it was there, 1735, that George Whitfield actually gave his life to Christ and became a believer. Shortly after, he would preach for the very first time. He preached in the church where he was baptized, the church where he had first received communion. And that preaching event began to develop in him a longing to preach. He felt that God blessed him. He felt encouraged by it. So he began preaching there throughout England, wherever he would have opportunity. About a year later, he, he began publishing his sermons. He recognized the power of, of the printing press and, and the power of distributing these sermons out, and his popularity began to grow, and more and more people began to come and hear this, this guy who was still so young preach. He was an incredible preacher, a powerful preacher. 1738 is when he made his first trip across the ocean to the colonies here. And, and what had happened was his old friends, John and Charles Wesley, they had actually left England, came over here to Georgia. They were serving as missionaries there. And they wrote this letter back to George and said, it was, it was this real impassioned plea where they said, you know, why don't you come, why don't you come help us bring people to the Lord? What was ironic about that was that neither John or Charles Wesley were actually believers at that point either. Both of them would look back and recognize a time after this where they would become followers of Christ. But Whitfield ends up going. He ends up crossing the ocean. He would make 13 trips across the Atlantic and end up spending about eight years of his life here in, in America. So he traveled back to England and... He began, um, I guess, maybe annoying some of the other local pastors there. They didn't like his style. He was very emotional. He was very theatrical. He had a background in the theater that was sort of just naturally came out of him as he stood behind the pulpit. And so what he started to learn was that the opportunities for him to preach in churches uh, were not as uh, frequent. They weren't as open to him. So he said, you know what, I'm going to go outside and preach. I'm going to preach outside. So the first time he did this, he preached to some coal miners, and he stood out there on a hill. There were about a hundred guys as they were coming up from the mines that day, and by the time he finished preaching, word had spread, and there was over a thousand people that had gathered. Whitfield would look back at that time, and he would say, they were glad to hear of a Jesus who was a friend to publicans and came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And he would say, Many, many people received Christ that day. So it was obvious that not only did people want to hear what he was saying, but it was obvious that God was using him. God was using him in, in incredible ways, in powerful ways, through his preaching to see people come to the Lord. Later that year, as he would come back to the colonies here in America, that he met a young publisher in Philadelphia named Benjamin Franklin. It's fascinating to me that those two were friends, and lifelong friends. They, they were friends uh, for the next 31 years until Whitfield died, because Franklin was not a believer. 
But he was a businessman, and he recognized that there was something here in, in Whitfield. So they began a business relationship initially where Whitfield agreed to allow Franklin to publish his journals and his sermons. Between uh, 1740 and 1742, Ben Franklin published 43 books and pamphlets about Whitfield and about the evangelical movement there. And Franklin had heard He'd heard reports, he'd read reports from, from London newspapers about this man who would speak to crowds of 10,000 and 20,000 people. And I think he was a little skeptical, like, like maybe you would be or I would be. And he was always the experimenter. And so George Whitfield came to Philadelphia and he was preaching there. And so Ben Franklin records this and he said, so I... I wanted to see how far he actually could be heard. So I started backing up and he would say, I, I went down this street, went down here by the river and kept going until I could no longer hear him. And then he's like, I determined the distance to be this and he makes this radius and this circumference and he's like, if about two square feet per person. Anyway, Franklin does all of this to say, in my estimation, he could be heard by 30 thousand people. Is that unbelievable? Franklin would write also about his eloquence in the pulpit. He would say every accent, every emphasis, every modulation of his voice was so perfectly well turned and well placed that without being interested in the subject, one could not help being pleased with the discourse. He would write about his integrity. Some of Whitfield's opponents would question uh, his fundraising and question other things about that, his, his motivations and his theatrics in the pulpit. And Franklin would say, he was in all his conduct a perfectly honest man. And methinks my testimony in his favor ought to have the more weight as we had no religious connection. There's Franklin saying, look, I'm not even, I don't even believe what this guy believes, but I can attest to his integrity. And it's interesting that over those 30 years, Whitfield would frequently urge Ben Franklin to accept Christ as his Savior. He would remind him that, hey, I, I'm praying for you. Franklin said Whitfield would sometimes pray for my conversion, but never had the satisfaction of believing that his prayers were heard. Just two years before Whitfield's death, he would write to Ben Franklin and said, you and I shall soon go out of the world that you and I may be in the happy number of those who in the midst of the tremendous final blaze shall cry, amen. Hallelujah, that is my hearty prayer. He would remind Ben Franklin that he's, that's, he's still praying for him. We'll continue to move through here. And in 1740, he begins this orphanage in Georgia. It's called Bethesda. In fact, there's uh, Bethesda Academy continues to operate there on that site to this day. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. It was also in 1740 that in Boston he preached a sermon outside to about 20,000 people. At that time, Boston's entire population was only 17,000. So this was, the more people came to hear him speak than, than lived in the entire city of Boston. It's funny that in his original journal entry, Whitfield estimated that the crowd was 30,000. I mean, he was a good church person, right? Always kind of rounding up. Yeah. Like tonight, there's about 300 people here tonight, right? Um, the newspapers suggested 23,000, so it, it's somewhere around there. But even if those newspaper articles are even close to right, historians would say, well, that was quite possibly the largest gathered crowd in the history of the English colonies up to that point were there to hear Whitfield preach. A year later, marries a woman by the name of Elizabeth James. Elizabeth was a widow. She was 10 years older than him. And theirs was not a happy marriage. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a while. Time passes. In 1747, he acquires a plantation in South Carolina. So through his travels, he would be raising money for this orphanage in Georgia. 
And so he acquires this plantation. He called it Providence. It was a 640-acre property there that he intended to use for the support of this orphanage there in Georgia. Problem was, and, and we'll, we'll dive into all of this stuff in just a little while, is that at that time, this is South Carolina, 1747, that plantation was, was run by slaves. So you wonder what, what was going through his mind as he agreed to that. He continues traveling throughout the colonies and back and forth across the ocean. He got to about age 40 and his health starts to decline at that point. In fact, he, he wrote, he said, <clears throat> Whitfield wrote in his journal, I love this line, he said, I dread a corpulent body, but it breaks in upon me like an armed man. <laughs> uh, this is something interesting that also happened later in his life. In, in 1753, Whitfield would publish a collection of hymns. And we've already mentioned Charles Wesley, his, his old friend, the great hymn writer. But several years prior to this, Charles Wesley wrote a hymn and published a hymn for Christmas. And his hymn started like this. Hark, how all the welkin rings. Glory to the King of Kings. You've probably never heard that line before. The word welkin is this old English word that kind of means this heavenly dome, or something like that. But Whitfield said, you know, I like that song. I just want to change it a little bit. So in 1753, when Whitfield published his collection of hymns, he changed that opening line to hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. I think we can all agree it was a pretty good change, right? 1768, his wife, Elizabeth, dies of an illness, and then two years after that, he would die in Massachusetts. It's just a real quick overview of this man's life, and I want to talk, we've, we've alluded to some things as we kind of walk through that timeline. I just want to talk about some of the things that we can learn from this man. And why are we studying his life? Why are we talking about him? And I want you to see, number one, that, that he believed, like we believe, that grace, God's grace, is life-changing. God's grace is life-changing. You know, we talked about his, his time in this holy club there at Oxford and how diligently he, he worked. He fasted. He prayed. He did all these things. And all of it was from a dead, unconverted heart. After his conversion, Whitfield wrote this. He said, I began to read the Holy Scriptures upon my knees, laying aside all other books and praying over, if possible, every line and word. And this proved meat indeed and drink indeed to my soul. I daily received fresh life, light, and power from above. Because God had changed him. He was no longer doing these works from a, from a dead heart. He was now doing these works from a heart that had been revived and made new through the glorious grace of Jesus. Hey, have you experienced that freedom? Have you experienced God's grace? Have you truly felt God's love for you? We talk about God's love all the time, but... But have you stopped to think for a minute about this love that never changes? You know, sometimes we can have, we can have a real spiritual day, can't we? It's like, man, you, you spend time in the Word, and it's just so fruitful. You feel God speaking to you. You have a great prayer time. Man, maybe you give some money to somebody on the street. You share the gospel with somebody, and by the end of that day, you are feeling so good about yourself. And I think if we're not careful, at the end of that day, we can start to think, man, like, I have killed it today, right? God, like, I am like God's superstar today. But man, what about on those other days? What about on those, those opposite days 
those days where you barely have time to get out the door, you don't read your Bible, you don't pray, you fight with somebody at work, you yell at somebody on the road, you get home and fight with your family. How do we feel at the end of that day? And how freeing is it to realize that God's love for us is no different on either one of those days? That God doesn't feel any differently about you or me on either one of those days? It's freeing. This is what, this is what Paul was talking about in Galatians. He's, he's writing there to the church and he said, you know, are, are you so foolish you, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? If we're not careful, we who, who think so highly of God's grace all of a sudden think, well, God's grace is, yes, our entry into the kingdom, and now it's these works that keep us here. And Paul is, is telling the Galatians and us, hey, that, that's not how it works. It's all grace. Every day is God's grace. Whitfield would say, I know no other reason why Jesus has put me into the ministry than because I am the chief of sinner and therefore fittest to preach free grace to a world lying in the wicked one. He knew that God's grace is life-changing. He knew, number two, that the gospel is empowering. And what do I mean by that? Well, talked about his theatrics in the, pulp in the pulpit, right? He was known for this booming voice that could be heard by so many thousands of people. And he was known for this theatrical way that he preached. Now, think about the time and where he was. And 18th century pastors in England did not preach that way. And that's why I think a lot of them looked at him like, man, what is wrong with you? <clears throat> One person wrote that, when an eyewitness there to his preaching said, he moved with such vehemence upon his bodily frame that the audience felt a momentary apprehension for his life. People would write about him stamping his foot and raising his hands and weeping. One person said sometimes he, he, would, he would weep so much that he would take several minutes to compose himself. What was that like while people are out here listening, while he's trying to compose himself? He was an emotional man in the pulpit, but he realized the power of the gospel to change people's hearts and lives. Whitfield said that there, there are three ways that you can speak. You know, you can speak of an imaginary world as if it were real. That's what actors do, right? Actors on a stage, they're, they're playing out a scene. They're speaking of an imaginary world as if it were real. He said, you can also speak of a real world as if it were unreal. And he said, no, this is what half-hearted preachers do, right? They're talking about things like heaven and talking about things like God's grace, and it sounds like they're talking about the grass growing outside. And he said, but there's a third way. You can speak about a real spiritual world as if it were incredibly real and magnificently real and terrifyingly real. And he would conclude and say, look, this, therefore, I will shout loudly, I will not be a velvet-mouthed preacher. Because he had something real to talk about. He knew that what he was talking about was literally a matter of life or death. John Piper, in his biography of Whitfield, gives this illustration. He says, you know, say there's an actress in a movie. She's the mother of a child caught in a burning house. And as the cameras are focused on her, she's yelling to the fireman. She's pointing to the window on the second floor where her child is. She's acting. He said, but if a house is on fire in your neighborhood and you see a mother screaming to the fireman in the front yard and pointing up to the second window, she's not acting. Now, what they're doing is the same, but the difference is in the second scenario, there really is a child up there. There really is a child in danger. There it really is a fire, and there's someone who needs to be saved. And he would use that illustration to say, now, when we think about Whitfield in the pulpit, when we think about all of his emotion and all of his passion and all of his theatrical ways that he portrayed this, this is why he does it. All preaching seeks to persuade people, right? You, 
there is a judgment coming. You're, you're in danger. But there is a way of escape through Jesus Christ. I mean, that's the gospel. Every Sunday, when you come here, the songs that we sing, the sermon that is preached, will always talk about the gospel. Because the gospel's all we have to talk about. Every week we're telling that same story over and over and over again because the gospel is empowering. But I want you to see number three, that sin is blinding. Sin is blinding. Let's talk about a couple things in Whitfield's life. You know, one of the dangers of biography, and especially Christian biography, is that we turn it into this picture of a saint, right? That they were perfect. I grew up in church. I grew up hearing Bible stories. And, you know, you kind of grow up thinking, man, everybody in the Old Testament, they were like awesome, right? They were incredible. And you think that until you actually start reading the Bible. And it's like, you know what? They actually weren't. And George Whitfield is the same way. Um, he had a really strange relationship with his family. Mentioned his wife. There, there's no evidence, really, that there was any kind of affection there, any kind of love there. She, through everything that, that we can see looking back, she was more of an assistant for him, a co-worker for him, someone who helped him uh, logistically. A couple months after his marriage, he wrote to a friend of his and said, about 11 weeks ago, I married, in the fear of God, one who was a widow of about 36 years of age and has been a housekeeper for many years. She's neither rich in fortune nor beautiful as to her person, but I believe a true child of God. <laughs> um, this woman had a daughter. And so when they married, George Whitfield had a stepdaughter. And there is almost no mention of her in any correspondence that, that George had with his wife. It's weird, right? But not just his family. Let's talk about his plantation. Let's talk about slavery. When Whitfield initially came to America, he was, he was opposed to slavery. He spoke out publicly against it. He was appalled and remained this way, but appalled at the way that that many slave owners treated their slaves. But through the years, Whitfield began to change his mind on this issue. I don't know if there was some kind of practical reason what the reason was, we can speculate, but, but he began to change his mind. And so when he acquired this plantation, he acquired the slaves that came along with it. Well, the, the orphanage that he ran was in Georgia. And Georgia, at that time, slavery was prohibited. In, in fact, it was the only colony where slavery was prohibited right from the very beginning. But Whitfield began lobbying, actually, for the legalization of slavery in Georgia. So he started sort of actively seeking to do this. And he would say, you know, this is for... There's all this work that needs to be done around the orphanage. This is, for, this is for good things. And so in 1752, slavery was legalized in Georgia. What's interesting about him is he did more to evangelize the slave community in Georgia than anybody. He would write letters to newspapers defending the evangelism of slaves because that was something a lot of people didn't do. They said, man, if we actually share the gospel with slaves, they're going to get this idea that everybody's equal, and we don't want that. But George Whitfield, from the very beginning, longed to see these slaves come to know Christ. One historian dates what he calls the advent of black Christianity in Philadelphia to Whitfield's first time preaching there. He said that over a thousand slaves would hear his sermons in Philadelphia as he came there to preach. And so what can we say about that? I, I don't even know what to say other than to say 
that sin is blinding. Sin causes us to, to miss things. <clears throat> Several years ago, when Whitney and I were dating, we were at a Chili's uh, with her family. I like to eat spicy food, and spicy food makes me sweat. So I'm sitting there eating my spicy food, and Whitney's sitting next to me, and you know, her sister and parents are on the other side of the table, and I'm wiping my head with this napkin. And it wasn't until I, I was finished eating and I got up to go to the restroom and I had this big piece of napkin just sticking on my <laughs> forehead there. You know, Whitney's sister's like, well, yeah, I saw it, but I wasn't going to say anything. I'm like, thanks a lot. Man, but we miss, we miss things. Paul Tripp, who's a great, great author, he has a book uh, called Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands, and this is what he says. He says, my self-perception is as accurate as a carnival mirror. He says, if I'm going to see myself clearly, I need you to hold the mirror of God's word in front of me. You know, you think about Whitfield and slavery, and there was never a time, we don't at least have any record of any time in Whitfield's life where there was anyone else who opposed his view of slavery. What makes the blindness caused by sin so problematic is, you know, if you are physically blind, you know that you're blind, right? And so you have ways to compensate for that. But when you're spiritually blind, you are blind to the fact that you're blind. Sin is, is deceptive. And so sometimes we can, we can be so deceived and so blinded by sin. Man, just, just a couple of examples. You know, sometimes you can be sharing maybe a, a prayer request with a mutual friend that, if you're not careful, can pretty quickly turn into just gossip, where you're no longer asking for them to pray. You're, you're kind of really just gossiping. Um, we can say, yeah, I, I'm careful with my finances. I want to be a good steward. And, and if we're not careful, that can quickly turn into greed and selfishness. We can say, look, I just want to care for my family. Uh, and if we're not careful, that can pretty quickly turn into idolatry. All these good things can be twisted because that's what, that's what the devil does. Sin deceives us. And this is why, like Paul Tripp says, we need each other. Because we are never, th listen to this, we are never going to fully be able to recognize all of our own sin on our own. I think that's worth thinking about for a minute. That there is always going to be sin in your life that you are never going to fully recognize unless someone brings it to your attention. That's what the church is for. We talk about community. We talk about accountability. We talk about being in a relationship with someone where they have the ability and the freedom to say, hey, you know, I've, I've noticed this. That doesn't mean that every time somebody says something, they're going to be exactly right. But you know what? Most times when somebody says something like that, there's going to at least be an element of truth. To what they say. That's what the author of Hebrews says. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So my question for you is, who, who's that person for you? Who helps you to see what you can't see? Who's that person who holds God's word up as a mirror to you? To say, hey, this, this is what I'm seeing in, in your life. Number four, God's plan is confounding. I had to just keep going with it. <clears throat> confounding. Here's what I mean. Some of our heroes, some of the people that we look back to and respect and admire, have just done some stupid things. <laughs> 
And all of our heroes are sinners. And I say this, and it's like, yeah, we know that, right? But I think sometimes we forget that. Just think about the Bible for a minute. Just think about a couple characters. Noah. You know what the Bible says about Noah? Noah was a righteous man, Genesis 6. Blameless in his generation, Noah walked with God. That's some high praise right there. Noah and his family, of course, were saved in the ark. What's one of the first things Noah does? He gets drunk and lay, passes out naked in his tent. This is a man who the Bible says was blameless in his generation. David, of course, we know David. We know that the Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. And we look at what David did and say, well, of course you don't actually mean that though, right? You can't say a man after God's own heart. Look at what he did. And yet, that's what it says. What about Jonah? Right? Jonah, he was disobedient, but also just reluctant. Even when he preached and the whole city converted all the way to the king, the Bible says, Jonah was angry. He was like, God, look, this is why I didn't want to come here, because I know that you're a merciful God. I know that you pardon sinners. I mean, what kind of guy is that? And then there's Peter. I mean, within hours of him saying, I'm going to die for you, he denies that he ever even knew Jesus. The Bible's filled with examples like that. And so why is it that it's so hard for us to appreciate the, the good that someone has done and also point out the areas in which they've failed? It's okay for us to say, hey, that was awesome, and this is not. <laughs> there doesn't have to be these sort of blanket endorsements to say, well, if I say that I like this person and I appreciate them, and I admire them, and I respect them, that means I appreciate and admire and respect everything they've ever done or said. Remember what Paul said in Philippians chapter 1? Where he's talking about these, these other preachers. He said, yes, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. We should celebrate. We should celebrate God's ability to use anyone to expand his kingdom and bring him glory. If you think about George Whitfield and the First Great Awakening, I'm mentioned Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards, another catalyst there in the first Great Awakening, in their styles, could not have been more different. Jonathan Edwards was this theological stalwart, and he would read his sermons from a manuscript in a monotone voice, and then you have the exact opposite. You know, Whitfield, all that preaching that he did, he, he preached without notes. He would, just, he would just get up and talk and watch people receive Christ. How different those two people are, stylistically. But God, God can use anybody. J.C. Ryle would look at George Whitfield's life and say, I believe that the direct good which he did to immortal souls is incalculable. Think about how many people owe their conversion to the preaching of a man like George Whitfield. And we'll never know that until, we, until we're in heaven. But God's plan is confounding. God can use anyone that he wants to do anything that he wants at any time that he wants because he's God. And close with one last thing that Whitfield said. He says, I am nothing, I have nothing, and I can do nothing without God. What, although I may, 
like a polished sepulcher appear a little beautiful without, yet within I am full of pride, full of self-love and all manner of corruption. However, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And if it should please God to make me instrumental to do the least good, not unto me, but unto him, be all the glory. That's what Whitfield wanted to be said about his life, that he wanted God to get all the glory. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the way that your ways are not our ways, God, that your thoughts are not our thoughts, that you can do anything that you want. And thank you for the way that you used George Whitfield. Thank you for your grace that changed him. And God, may we leave here today with a fresh awareness of your grace and your love and your sovereignty. May it carry us throughout the rest of this week. May it bring us back on Sunday to worship together again. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.